Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's get started. So uh, this is uh, the fourth seminar of the summer series, and we're very happy to have uh, today with us someone who is working on the intersection of uh, language uh, and, and body intelligence with Andrew Lampinen, who uh, is a senior research scientist at Google DeepMind and whose, whose previous background uh, goes back to Stanford and um, Berkeley, if I remember correctly, and that uh, has done a lot of contributions in this area of cognitive uh, AI and around the language learning. So thank you very much for coming today to present his uh, brand new work. Um, it's yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about a paper we just put out on passive learning with active causal strategies. And I'm excited to tell you about this work because it really ties together a lot of the strands of research that I've been doing over the past couple of years. Research on reinforcement learning agents, on language models, on what you can learn from explanations and causality, and connects to some of my interests in philosophy and cognitive science. But because of that, it's going to be a bit of a talk with a lot of content in it, so I'm going to dive right in and hopefully we'll make it through. So I want to start with this fairly well-known observation from uh, causality that passive observations generally can't tell you the difference between causal structures and just correlations. For example, if you notice that cars are more likely to be broken when the mechanic is around, you don't know whether the mechanic is breaking the cars or something else is going on. If you notice that people with canes are more likely to have gray hair, you don't know whether gray hair is making you use a cane or canes are making you go gray or something else, and so on. And the way scientists get around this is that we do experiments where we actually take an intervention on the world. We change something about the world, and that allows us to tell the difference between correlational and causal structure. So for example, you might bring your car to the mechanic and see that, oh, the mechanic didn't break the car, they made it work better. Or you might give people some medicine and see how it affects their prognosis and how they do in the future. And this sort of idea of doing interventions has been formalized by Judea Pearl in a framework of sort of thinking about causal reasoning, which is based on this idea of causal directed acyclic graphs. So hopefully many of the people in this room are familiar with the directed acyclic graph. This kind of graph is one where the nodes you can think of as being variables that roughly correspond to some sort of state of something in the world, and the edges correspond to causal effects, like one thing has an effect on another thing. And what Perl introduced was this idea of a do operator, which lets you set the state of a node, intervene on the state of that node, and then see how that propagates through the graph. So for example, in this situation with the car and the mechanic, you might do an intervention where you bring a car to the mechanic and you see how that affects the states of other things in the world. And then you could do a different intervention where you break a car, maybe I'd do that one on my sister's car instead of mine, and then later I'd see that the car ends up at the mechanic. And from doing these kinds of interventions, I can conclude something about the causal structure of the world. In particular, that there's a causal edge that goes from a car being broken to the car ending up at the mechanic and not the other way around. Does that make sense? And so, based on these ideas, Perl introduced this causal hierarchy, which is showing up on my screen, but not on there. Okay, there we go. Um, and in this hierarchy, at the first level, you have associations or correlations, which is just sort of the conditional probabilities of one variable given another. And at the next level, you have the results of interventions, what you actually get when you change the state of the world, how that changes the probabilities downstream. And finally, there's counterfactuals, which we were just talking about before this, but I'm not going to touch on too much in this talk. And Perl, because of this hierarchy, has been expressed fairly pessimistic opinions about modern machine learning. And in particular, he's argued that modern machine learning is statistics-based, and so it's prevented from reasoning about things like actions, experiments, and explanations. And the impressive achievements of deep learning are just at the level of pure association. Okay, but of course this is a reinforcement learning seminar and so what you might all be saying to yourselves is, wait a second, RL can come to the rescue here, right? So reinforcement learning agents are capable of doing things in the world. They can really take actions that intervene on the world's state. 
And that means that, at least in principle, RL agents are not fundamentally limited in terms of what they can learn about the world, at least not fully limited. And indeed, there's been a lot of prior work in machine learning in the last, last few years showing that reinforcement learning agents can learn how to infer a causal structure or can meta-learn how to do that. And the basic way that these kinds of works work is that you give an RL agent the ability to do some interventions on the world, you put it in a situation each episode where there's some new causal structure, the RL agent does some interventions, sees how this world evolves, figures out what the causal structure is, and then is somehow rewarded for having correctly figured that out. And so there's been a bunch of prior work showing that reinforcement learning agents can go out and discover new causal structures. But, you know, in the last few years, people are less excited about people doing RL on toy tasks like these causal graphs, and everybody's been getting excited about what language models can do. And language model training is different from RL in that it really is passive, right? So when you train a language model, you take a corpus of text that some people have written on the internet, in books, wherever, and you train the system to passively predict it. So the way this works is that you take a giant transformer model, here it has four layers, but generally it would have more. You put sequences of text into it, where you give a partial sequence, like training language models is not, and then you propagate through the model some activations, letting it attend to the previous words that have occurred. And from that, you ask the model to predict what the next word will be. That's how you train the model, purely passive training. You can basically think of it as like doing behavioral cloning on human language, right? You're doing expert imitation on human language. And so a number of people have observed on Twitter, for example, that language models, because of this passive learning, are probably limited, right? They can't learn about the causal structure of the world because their data is passive. And in the literature, people have also written papers saying things like, well, language models are causal pairs. They might be able to say something about causality by imitating the text they've seen on the internet but they're not able to fundamentally make inferences about causal structure because of their observational data. At the same time, however, there's been other papers that have come out and argued that language models can sometimes do some sophisticated and interactive things that at least I might think of as requiring causal understanding. For example, this recent paper from Microsoft Research argued that language models provide a very strong prior for causal reasoning, in particular for inferring causal structures from data. And there's been a bunch of uh, splashes made in the news by language models doing things that are kind of like using tools, interacting with the world via APIs or other mediums, where you can prompt or maybe tune a language model to do something interactive. So you might think that these tasks involve some sort of causality. You know, using a tool to achieve some goal, that's really a fundamentally causal interaction. But there's a few caveats to these observations, right? One of them is that, well, it's hard to tell whether these models are actually doing some sort of generalizable causal reasoning process, or if they are just parroting causal structures they observed in their data, right? There's a lot of data on the internet. Pretty much anything you can think of is out there. And so it's hard to know without doing more careful experiments whether they're capable of causality. And then the, the, the second caveat is, well, if you think about a model like ChatGPT, it's trained with lots of other things besides just passive supervised learning. It's trained with perhaps with tool interactions, definitely with active RL for human feedback, and who knows what other mysterious ingredients go into something like that. And so we might think, ah, well, Maybe the pure language model couldn't do these causal tasks, but once you do some RL on top of it, then it could, again, because we know RL agents. But I was thinking about the tension between, you know, the passive training of language models, at least base language models, and these more exciting results. And, right, so language models are mostly passively trained, so why do they show some behaviors that seem causal? So I, I was thinking about that tension, and it made me think back to these classic causal RL meta-learning tasks. And I realized that, well, reinforcement learning agents certainly need to be able to intervene at test time on these tasks. They're going to be introduced to some new causal structure, and we need them to intervene to be able to figure out what that structure is. But it's not as obvious that the 
agents would need to do that at training time. And in particular, it made me wonder whether the agents could learn just from VC, like a pure language model, how to discover a strategy for experimenting and exploiting to a uh, causal structure that would generalize. And that's kind of the question that I tried to explore in this work. Is it possible to learn and generalize causal strategies and inferences just from doing passive VC on expert data? Or to make it a little bit more fun and metaphorical, could you learn to be a scientist just by reading enough books describing experiments and how they happen and what their outcomes are, and then use that knowledge to go out in the world and make some new scientific discoveries? Okay. So with that, I think that's enough passive introduction. Let's get to some actual experiments. Uh, are there any questions before I move on? Yes? Would you say that an action is the same as an intervention? I would say that an action is a particular kind of intervention, yes. Um, we can talk more about that at the end. So, yeah. Any other questions? Can we repeat the questions if somebody in the room is asking a question? Yes. Because we cannot hear them. Sorry. Yeah, the question was, is an action an intervention? And I said yes, in a particular way. Um, great. OK, so the, the first set of experiments I performed was an attempt to make as simple and clean a test of this as possible, using an environment a bit like what's been used in prior work on meta-learning and problem structures. In this case, the environment literally is a causal graph causal DAG over five variables that the agent can't directly observe. And in this graph, the variable values are set by linear effects of the ancestors. So there's some sort of edges in this graph. There's some weights on those edges. And the value of a node is set by the effects of its ancestors, plus some noise, and then finally a nonlinearity. And the agent, in this instance, literally gets to do interact interventions as actions, so the agent Actions correspond to interventions where you set the value of one variable in this graph to either a large positive value or a large negative value. And then you, the agent gets to observe the values of the nodes before its intervention, takes the intervention, and gets to observe the values of the nodes after that intervention, the outcome value. And to make this interesting and not totally trivial, the agent is trained to do a meta-learning task here, where each episode a new graph structure with new weights on the edges is sampled. And the agent gets a series of trials in which to learn about this graph structure. There are two phases to this. So first, there's an experimentation phase where the agent isn't given any explicit goal. It's just allowed to perform some interventions, see the outcomes of those interventions, and to use that to infer the graph structure. And then we give the agent an exploitation phase to test how much it's learned. We give it a goal variable to maximize, and it is rewarded after it intervenes with the outcome value of that variable. So for example, maybe in the structure on the left, the goal variable would be A. And the agent could intervene on A with a positive value. That would get some value from A. But maybe in this situation, it's better to intervene on C, because you get these multiple paths that could increase A. So the agent really has to infer the causal structure of the graph, and then reason over that structure to figure out how to achieve this goal. Does this make sense? Awesome. OK, so we're going to tra train these agents with behavioral cloning. And in particular, we're going to train them with BC on data generated by an expert policy that does interventions on each variable once during its experimentation phase, and then takes optimal actions during exploitation. Because in these simple structures, intervening on each variable once is sufficient to determine the causal structure. And to make things a little bit interesting, we're going to do a train test split on this data based on the causal structures that are allowed. And in particular, in the training data, we make sure that node D is never an ancestor, either directly or indirectly, of node E. For example, this edge here would not be allowed in the training distribution because it would make D an indirect ancestor of E via B. And then we test the agent on whether it can figure out how to maximize E in situations where D is a crucial ancestor of E. So in other words, there's a very strong, there is a very strong set of paths from D to E, uh, such that either 
In one condition, which we call eval target, D is the optimal place to intervene in order to maximize E, or D might be on the key path to maximizing E, but its ancestors could be better of interventions. And the idea is that this sets up a challenging generalization split that really relies on actual, the agent actually inferring the causal structure, because the agent has never seen any situations in training where intervening on D has any effect whatsoever on E. We're going to look at whether an agent trained passively on, these, on this training distribution can generalize to actively do the right thing on this test distribution. Okay, and these are the basic results. So we run over the course of the training active evaluation. So we're training this agent passively, but we take a checkpoint every thousand steps or so, and we test it on a bunch of episodes from the training and evaluation distributions and see how it does. And what you can see is that the agents very quickly learn how to achieve near optimal rewards. Uh, so this is on the y-axis here, I'm plotting the proportion of the op percentage of the optimal rewards that the agent receives on these test episodes. The gold curve shows the training distribution, and you can see that the agent is learning that very rapidly. The green and purple curves show the two different evaluation conditions, and the agent is learning them somewhat more slowly, but still pretty well. Um, yes. Of course, okay, so great. Agents are able to achieve some rewards in these tasks, but that alone isn't really sufficient evidence that the agents are actually doing something interesting and causal. And in particular, there's some simpler approaches in these settings that could allow the agent to achieve some evaluation performance without having to make inferences over the full causal graph. So we considered two possible versions of these, two heuristics, four possible versions, Two heuristics, one based on remembering sort of the values of nodes that you got after performing different interventions and choosing the, to do, repeat the intervention from the exploration phase that yielded the highest value on the goal node during the exploration phase, or using the intervention that yielded the largest change and then flipping the direction of that chip sign of that intervention if the change was negative. And we also considered some baselines based on correlational statistics, either a total correlation, sort of like the overall effect of one node on another, or a partial correlation, which is where you control for the effects of the other nodes. And what we find is that if we compare the agent to optimal expert behavior, shown in yellow, versus the baseline, shown in green and purple, the agent matches the expert much more closely, both within the train distribution on the left here and the two test distributions on the right. So, seems like agents can passively learn to do some sort of active causal experimentation and exploitation strategies. They can generalize to infer causal links that weren't present in the training data. At least in these simple plotting environments. So what I'm going to try to do in the next few sections of the talk is to step back some of the toy assumptions in this environment and move to slightly more complex settings and show that these kinds of strategies can still work. And the first place I'm going to do that is with a very small tweak to this environment to make the experimentation phase slightly more interesting. So in the previous experiments, the expert policy just intervened on every single variable, which of course is not a very scalable strategy to during experimentation. And if you were a human scientist, you would probably rely on some sort of domain knowledge to help you constrain your hypothesis space and decide which things you need to test and which things you don't. So what we tried to do is to set up a simple version of this where we add a bunch of extra variables to the graph, and then on each episode we give the agent a multi-hot cue which says, ah, these variables are the only ones that are relevant, the other ones won't be involved in the causal graph. And the expert policy that we train the agent to imitate only experiments on the variables that are cued as relevant, but we still include all the variables, all the irrelevant variables in the agent observations, and also a lot of the agent and again, during training, we're going to now hold out subsets of variables. So the agent's never going to see particular subsets of variables, as well as holding out the causal links, as we did above. We're going to ask whether the agent can generalize to first experiment correctly on a novel subset of variables at test time, and second, to use that knowledge to discover and exploit this novel causal dependency. And what we find is, again, yes, the agent is able to do quite well. So on 
On this curve, on the y-axis, I'm plotting the proportion of the time that the agent experiments on the correct set of variables. That is, it experiments once on each of the relevant variables and never experiments on any of the irrelevant ones. What you can see is that the agent is very rapidly learning how to do this in both the training and the testing distributions. Those curves look fairly similar, and they should, because the agent's policy should basically not depend on the training and test distributions on what the graph structure is, because the graph structure is really only relevant at the second phase, the exploitation phase. In the supplemental paper, we show that the agent does well in the exploitation phase, too. You can check it out there. Okay, any questions on this before I move on to the next? Okay, so that's cool and all, but that was a super toy environment in which the observations were just vectors where the variables were directly observable. And so the next thing that I wanted to do was to extend this to an environment with slightly more complex task structure and high dimensional visual observations. And to do that, I just stole this odd one out intervention environment from some previous work. And so, if you came to this series in the fall, you might have seen this talk by Felix Hill. And in this talk, one of the things that I believe he talked about was our paper, Tell Me Why, on explanations in RL. And if you came to that seminar, this might feel like a bit of deja vu for you, because I'm going to tell you about some of the same stuff you might have heard there, but in a different setting. Okay, so first I'm going to do a little parenthetical where I'm just going to introduce the concepts from that paper in the simplest experimental setting. And then I'll link it back to this sort of causal picture and the experiments we did in our current work. So what did we work on in this previous paper? Well, we were interested in trying to get RL agents to solve these odd one out tasks, which involve some kinds of abstractions and relational reasoning. And the way these tasks work is we present the, we put the agent in a room where there's a set of four objects, like these ones here, and the agent's goal is to choose the object that is unique in some way. For example, in this case, it would be the green pentagon. But we make this task hard for the agent by having four objects that vary along various dimensions, like color, shape, size, and texture. And the way we set up the initialization of the object features is such that looking at any proper subset of the objects won't tell you what the answer is. So for example, if you only considered these three objects on the left here, you would find you might think that the large pentagon is unique because it's the only large one or that this one's unique because it's the only green one, or that this one's unique because it's the only triangle, or the only one that's not striped. So the agent really has to consider all the features and their relations among all the objects in order to solve these tasks. And that makes these problems hard to solve from reward alone. And in particular, we found reinforcement learning agents have a pretty hard time learning these tasks from rewards alone, especially as you situate these tasks in more complex environments. So how do we get around this? Well, what we proposed in this prior work was to use explanations as a kind of auxiliary signal for the agents to help them to learn the task. And in particular, we considered a few different kinds of explanations agents could learn from. The first is reward explanations, and the idea there is that you get when you get a reward, you also get some natural language feedback that tells you something about why you got that reward. For example, if you choose the correct object, it might say, correct, that object is uniquely green. And you could think of this as being a bit like the feedback a teacher might give you on a test when they tell you why your answer was right or wrong. And the second kind we call properties explanations, although you might think of them more like descriptions that describe what the properties of an object are, like this is a large striped purple pentagon. And you can think of these as being a bit more like the kinds of explanations a parent would give to a child when they're explaining to the child what a new object is. We could argue about whether descriptions are explanations offline, but for our purposes, they are, at least in so far as they convey causal information for the task. Okay, so in this prior work, we said, well, suppose we have some explanations, how could we use them to help the agent learn? And the approach we took was to have the agent predict the explanations that are given by a teacher or a parent during a training. So the way this works is the agent chooses some object, let's say it's one on the left, and makes a prediction about what explanation it will get for the reward, like the teacher will say, correct, it's uniquely large. And then if the teacher provides some different explanation, like incorrect, other objects are large, purple striped pentagons, then the agent will be able to learn from the difference between these two things to predict the, the correct explanation better 
And the hope is that from that, the agent will learn more about the task structure so that it can perform the task better. And indeed, what we showed in that previous paper is that if you situate these on one out tasks, either in a 2D environment on the left or a 3D environment on the right, in both cases, agents trained with explanations in purple can learn them quite well, whereas agents trained without explanations can maybe learn a bit in the 2D case, but really are performing that chance in the 3D case, more or less. Cool. So that's the end of the parenthetical. Now that we've introduced those concepts, we can get back to talking about the actual causality stuff, because that didn't really involve so, in that paper on the odd one out tasks, we also considered a task that was a bit more like a mashup of the odd one out tasks and the causal dag tasks that I described previously. So, in particular, this task actually has an experimentation phase and an exploitation phase where the agent has to under determine some underlying causal structure. So, the way this works is that we give the agent a series of trials now of odd one out tasks and Underlying all of these trials, there's some latent correct feature, perhaps it's color in a given episode. And you can think of this as basically being some latent causal graph where there's multiple features that could contribute to the reward, and the agent has to identify this causal structure by performing some experiments. So the way it works is that the agent will try an experiment by transforming some object's properties like its shape, then see if it gets a reward for that, Transforming an, object, uh, an object's texture, see if it gets a reward for that. Transform the color, see if it gets a reward, maybe finally it does. Then finally we give the agent an exploitation phase. We give it a trial where it no longer has the magic wand, it can't transform objects, but there's different objects which are unique in different ways. So one has unique texture, one has unique color, and another has unique shape. And the agent is rewarded, is highly rewarded for choosing the object that's unique, according to this latent causal structure, which it's supposed to have inferred from the work of the trials. Does that make sense? Cool. And to give some explanations, we use similar approaches to what I described previously, where, for example, after rewards, we give the agent some feedback from the teacher that tells it something about why it got the reward. For example, saying, ah, oh, the latent feature is color, and this object is unique. Okay, that was sort of a schematic de description of the tasks, but I want to emphasize that these tasks are actually grounded out in some high-dimensional observations that look more like this, and they're a little bit partially observable and so on. So this is actually what a, an example episode from the environment might look like. The first frame observation the agent would see would be something like this on the left, where there's the agent is in the middle of the room, it's this sort of white square. The agent starts at a random place in the room, but in this case it's in the middle. There's some objects around the edges of the room. The agent has to first navigate to an object, do some intervention on it to transform its shape, and then choose an object to select from the episode and see if it gets a reward. And again, we're going to take a similar approach to in the cause of DAG tasks, where we train the agent via behavioral cloning on passive data generated by an expert, which acts almost optimally to discover the latent variable and then uses it to achieve. So we did two trained test splits of this task, um, either by just which feature uh, combinations were used or by changing the experiment difficulty, which you can check out the paper for the details because it's kind of complicated. But in either case, the agents generalize well from passive training to these evaluation conditions. So on the left, I'm showing the feature split and the gold curve is training, green is test. On the right is this uh, relation split and gold curve is training and purple is test. And in both cases, Agents are doing really well. And like in the prior work, we found that explanations help to support that passive learning. So on these four plots, I'm showing the train and test accuracy for the four conditions. The pink curves are the ones I showed you previously, where the agents trained with explanations. The blue curves are an ablation where the agents are trained without explanations. And you can see that the pink curves are always doing better than the blue curves, so the explanations are helpful. But if you looked at the previous work, you might be kind of surprised because the differences aren't as dramatic as they are for the enforcement learning agents. And presumably that's because the expert policy gives you more information about the task than it's easy to get from the reward alone. Cool. So it seems like agents can passively learn causal strategies in some more complex environments. 
And explanations can help, even if they're not essential. How, how is this for Joseph? Like, is, do you train them with an agent, or is that human that was doing neuro? How, how do you find neuro? Uh, yeah, so the, the policy is hard coded, and it's basically, it, it, it's a heuristic. So, like, it first navigates to the center of the room because it has to be able to observe all the objects, and that's a way we can guarantee it observes all the objects without doing anything slightly like more complicated. So that's one of the things that's not fully optimal, right? So it sometimes does extra navigation that doesn't need to do this way. Um, but it, it always does a correct experiment, and it always behaves correct optimally based on things it has observed about the underlying causal structure. Yeah. Yes. So following on uh, from that, so how does that translate into the lab environment, right? So uh, it seems to me that this kind of like patient optimization would choose the best intervention. So would, would the expert basically know the graph and say, okay, I'm going to take the, 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 the direct parent or how, how do you? Yeah, so in, in the DAG environments, great question. So in the DAG environments, the the expert experimentation strategy is just pick a random variable and then it experiment on the variables one at a time after that. Um, the exploitation strategy, it basically we just cheat on that because we know that the expert could have inferred the causal structure, and so we just have the expert take the optimal action. Because I was too lazy to actually code up the Bayesian uh, inference over the causal structures, which is actually fairly non-trivial, especially if you want to incorporate the constraints on like what the structures are and so on. Yeah. But that that is so yeah, we just cheat on the expert policy for that one. It's a little bit easier. Um, yeah, any more questions? Yes. Um, so uh, my understanding is that you can use the, the reward signal uh, as like a secret signal to learn the formula structure of the environment. Is it possible to go the other way? So once you have the formula structure, can you use that to like augment the reward signal? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's various ways you could think about that. And to lead into the next section, I'm going to give you one way you could think about that, which is that one way that we think about explanations from a cognitive science perspective is that they're a way of sort of distilling some of the causal structure for the world into someone else's head, right? So like I could give you an explanation like, oh, your you know, code failed to compile because your CUDA version is outdated or something. And that tells you something about the causal structure of the world, the link between some state of your computer and something that happens when you try to do something that is useful for you, right? It, it allows you to generalize better to new situations. And so what we tried to do in the next set of experiments is basically show this, that if you, if some system like a teacher has knowledge of some causal structure, maybe they could use explanations to infer, still that causal structure into an agent. Uh, so maybe this will satisfy you. And if not, we can talk about it later. Uh, yeah, so in the next set of experiments, what we tried to show is that explanations can shape how an agent generalizes out of distribution. And the way we set this up is that we took these odd one out tasks and we made them confounded. So what we did is we put the object in a room where now there's a single object, the screen one here, that's unique along many feature dimensions. It's got a unique shape, it's got a unique texture, and it's got a unique color. And so the agent, if it's rewarded for choosing this object, won't know which of those features was the underlying one. Right? You can think of it as there's this implicit causal graph where these different features could be contributing to the reward, and the agent doesn't know which of these edges are present because it always evolved in, it always observes these features having the same relational state. And we're going to train the agent on settings like that and test it on deconfounded settings, a bit like the test trials from the earlier experiments, where there are different objects that are unique in different ways. And the question is, is there anything we can do without changing this training distribution to push around which object the agent will choose at evaluation time when the features are deconfounded? And in particular, the approach we took was to give explanations that focus on a particular dimension, right? So we could give the agent an, an explanation that focuses on color, like if it chooses this object on the left, we could say, actually that's incorrect because other objects are purple. We could give an explanation focusing on shape, like that's incorrect because other objects are triangles. 
Or we could give an explanation focusing on textures, like that's indirect because other functions are solid. And we do a between agents manipulation of this explanation condition. So we train different agents to predict different kinds of explanations. And of course, you might ask, well, if the features are confounded, how can the agent know that triangle refers to the shape and not the color? The answer is that it's really the relationships among the features that are confounded, their uniqueness that's confounded. So on a different episode, you'll still have an object that's unique along all three dimensions, but it'll be a triangle, but maybe now it's an orange and dotted triangle. So if these things are always referred to as triangles, the agent can infer that triangle refers to the shape. And what we showed is, like our previous work showed for reinforcement learning agents, explanations can really strongly shape the way agents generalize to these out of distribution tests. So on this graph here, I'm plotting in this deconfounded evaluation, the proportion of the time that the agent chooses an object that matches the kinds of explanations it was trained to give. So the purple curve is for color explanations, the blue curve is for shape, and the green is for texture. And in every case, the agent is basically always choosing an evaluation, the objects that match the explanations that I gave in training. And this you know, might be kind of surprising because, of course, the agent isn't forced to use these explanations for the tasks. But if the task is hard to learn, then the explanations that you're given just become salient. They shape the agent's feature representations in such a way that it's really biased towards using the features that are explained. So this is a very toy demonstration, of course, but hopefully it gives you one way that you could instill some causal structure that you know into a system. Yeah, but I only the explanation, but also there was uh, pointing to what explanation. No. So, uh, yeah, it, it, important point. So the question was, aren't the rewards also pointing towards the Which one is correct? So the agent is only trained on these settings, where there's an object that's unique in color, unique in shape, and unique in texture. The same object, right? So if the agent chooses it, it doesn't know which of those features, you know, it's rewarded for all of those things at the same time. Right? And so it doesn't know which of those features is causing the reward. Uh, and so in the test cases, of course, they're disentangled, but those are only used for testing. Great question. OK, so predicting explanations, at least in some cases, can change how passively trained agents generalize. All right, so that was a bunch of stuff about toy RL tasks. And I told you nobody cared about those things now, so let's talk a bit about some more. And hopefully you can see where I'm sort of pointing at some relevance for language models here. Because language models are trained on passive data, sure, but they're trained on internet text, which contains lots of descriptions of experiments, their outcomes, and explanations of those experiments. For example, on Wikipedia, where you can read about all kinds of science experiments, or on Stack Overflow, where you can read about the experiments people performed when they were debugging, explanations of what they got and why, and someone else telling them why that happened and how to do things differently in the future. And so you might think that language models could take this passive training on information about experiments and explanations and use that to learn something about real causal structure. So the next thing we wanted to do in this paper was try to evaluate that. And we wanted to try to test the kinds of causal reasoning that we explored with these passively trained agents on language models that are also only trained passively, so no RL from human feedback or anything like that. And in particular, we use this chinchilla language model that was trained a few years ago now, I guess, by DeepMind with 70 billion parameters. So not huge, but not small. Um, and basically what we did was we took these odd one out intervention tasks that I told you about with the agent, and we turned them into a language-based task complete with various kinds of explanations. The hope is that this is a weird enough task that it's not going to be anywhere on the internet in the training text. You know, there's certainly concepts of uniqueness and probably even odd one out tasks on the internet, but this idea of having odd one outs along multiple dimensions where you do transformations on objects in order to identify another one, probably not going to be on the internet. And Chinchilla was trained before our previous paper came out, came out or the data was collected before our previous paper came out. So hopefully this is a unique task for the and basically what we're going to do is just take the same task that we gave to the agents and just stick a language model into it. In order to do that, 
we uh, turn this task into a language task by rendering the observations in language and turning the actions into language, uh, into multiple choice language tasks. Um, so the way this works is that we eliminated a bunch of the more complicated things about the environment, like navigation and partial observability. We just give the agent, uh, the language model observations like this. There are three objects in front of me, describe the objects. Then we give it a choice, I transform object and I'm indicating the things that where the language model had to take an action in bold. So the model chooses which object it's going to transform and then chooses which feature it's going to transform on that object. Then it gets some feedback on whether it was rewarded or not, does some more experiments. And finally, we give it a test trial where there's different objects that are unique in different ways. The model gets a slightly different prompt and it's asked to choose which of the objects it selects and then it gets feedback on whether and into this prompt, we can, of course, inject things like explanations, which the language model can generate for itself, like an explanation of why an outcome occurred. Or we can inject reasoning traces, like why, why, what the model should do next. And the question we're going to ask is, how well is the model able to do these tasks, and how does it depend on these explanations and reasoning traces? Okay, but We'd like to set up some sort of trained test split, of course, so that we can say that the model is actually doing some generalization. And so the way we set this up is that we give the model a four-shot prompt, so it has some examples of these kinds of tasks, where we use an expert policy to make choices, and we use expert-generated explanations and reasoning. And in the shots from the prompt, uh, definitely it's some typo there, in the shots from the prompt, the tasks are such that the rewarding dimension is always one of two dimensions, maybe color and shape, whereas another dimension, texture, is held out. It's not rewarding the prompt. And we do some automatic selection of the prompt. Basically, we sample a set of 20 prompts, I think, maybe 10, maybe 20. Um, and we select them based on their performance, again, on tasks from these two training dimensions. And we're going to evaluate them on their performance on the tasks from this held out dimension. So first I'll show you the performance of the model on new tasks from the training dimensions. And what you can see is that with explanations in pinkish here, the model does quite well on ta new tasks from the training distribution. Without explanations, it also does pretty well, right? Not, not super different, maybe not statistically significant. However, on the tasks from the held out dimension, there's a dramatic difference. So again, the models that are prompted with explanations and reasoning traces do fairly well at these tasks from the held out test distribution. But the, uh, but the models that are prompted without explanations are doing mostly very poorly with a couple of rare exceptions. So we thought this was kind of interesting. So it seems like language models can learn this odd one out ta intervention task from examples in context they can generalize that knowledge to a new version of the task where there's a new dimension that's rewarding as long as they're given explanations as well. Okay, and if you're interested in which explanations matter, uh, it turns out that basically either having outcome explanations or reasoning traces uh, before the choice will, will work. Having instructions is not as good for generalization um, and maybe explanations alone are slightly better than reasoning traces alone, but I just said that because I'm more interested in explanations. Reasoning traces are pretty good. Cool. And with that, I'd like to spend a few minutes wrapping up and leave some time for discussion at the end. So I started this talk by asking, you know, metaphorically, whether you could learn to be a scientist just by reading enough books describing experiments. And I think what these results suggest is that Yes, in some cases you could, at least if those books, you know, explain why an experiment was done and what the results imply. To make that a little bit more formal, it's, it's possible to learn strategies for inferring causal structure from experiments and then exploiting it to achieve some goal from purely passive data, at least if that data contains examples of experts doing that kind of experimentation. This works in simple toy DAG environments and in more complex ones with pixel observations and some relational structure. Explanations can help support that learning and can shape how agents generalize out of distribution from confounded data. 
And language models, likewise, can generalize novel strategies from a few shock prompts, at least if that prompt includes explanation. And I think, if nothing else, this provides some footnotes on some of these prior claims that have been made about language models and causality. Actually, it turns out that language models could learn quite a bit about causality and experimentation just from being trained on passive data. But before we go to questions, I do want to highlight some things that this work doesn't imply and a couple of caveats. So the first thing that this work doesn't imply is that passive learning is as good as active learning. That's just definitely not true. So there's experiments with humans, with animals, and with RL agents that all show that passive learning is worse than active learning. There's various reasons for this. Of course, BC itself, at least the most vanilla version of BC, is fundamentally limited by how good the data you're training on is. And even if you ignore causal structure, there's various reasons that active learning are not is not as good as uh, the passive learning is not as good as active learning. For example, just the fact that you have to you might have to repeat things that you already know, whereas if you're actively learning, you could seek out things you don't know. And perhaps because of this, most language models that are actually deployed are trained with are tuned with some interactive objectives like RL and human feedback. And so I expect that. Interactive training would likely improve the results on these kind of tasks, especially as you get to more complex environments. The point of this paper is really just to highlight that passive learning can go a surprisingly long way. The second thing that this work doesn't imply is that confounding is not a problem. So there's certainly cases where explanations might help you to overcome confounding, but only if the explanations are there and accurate, which is definitely not a guaranteed thing. For example, if you look in the medical literature, there's lots of cases where humans are still trying to figure out confounding and structures that we're quite interested in, such as how alcohol consumption affects cardiovascular health. And so it's definitely the case that not every explanation on the internet is right, and there may be some rather fundamental limitations on how well language models can do because of the inadequacy of the knowledge that they're trained on. So with that, I, those caveats in mind, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and thank my collaborators. So Stephanie, Ishida, Andrew, and Jane were co-authors co on this paper, as well as uh, the people who worked with me on the previous explanations paper, Nick, Allison, Yan, Neil, Jay, Adam, and Felix. Yeah, and thanks to all of you for listening. Happy to take some questions. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, in the way you concluded, you, you, you kind of claim that LM can learn just causality just from passive data. But at the same time, you highlighted the importance of explanations, right? Do you regard explanations as passive data or a bit more than that? So, that's an interesting question. And, and in some sense, you could think of, even setting the explanations to the side, you could think of the fact that, like, you know, those Wikipedia pages that describe experiments are describing interventions, right? So you can think of them as kind of being like intervention data, right? And so the notion of what's passive here is a little bit complicated. Yeah. And maybe that's part of the point of this paper is that the data is passive in the sense that you just took it off the internet and you're just imitating it. But that data tells you quite a lot about the causal structure of the world through things like explanations, and maybe that's all that you need. So it, in the paper, one of the things we reference is in this quote from Pearl in the longer form, one of the things he says is that, you know, you can't learn anything from observational data without some reference to the world beyond the data. And one way you can think about explanations is that they're providing that reference, right? They're telling you something about the world that generates the, the things that you're observing, the things that are present in language, and in that way they're allowing you to kind of escape from pure observation in some sense. So that is one way of thinking about the results, definitely. Okay. So I wanted to ask, um, so uh, from what you explained, the gap uh, for the explanation seems to be more relevant for the language models and from the Hebrew cloning. I remember you earlier. Yes. I think it's 
partly because the behavior of cloning agents just have a lot more data to make up that difference with, right? So the language models thought four examples in the prompt. Behavioral cloning agent, I'd have to look at the learning curves again, but it was probably at least 10,000 updates with a you know, batch size of like 32 or whatever. I don't know how many episodes that corresponds to, but you know, at, at least like a thousand times more, probably, probably more like 10,000 times more episodes than the language model saw. And so, you know, enough quantity can make up for some explanations missing. Um, but of course, there are cases like the the um, experiments with the confounded observations, you can never figure that out from just the data without explanations, right? You have to have something else that's telling you what's correct there. And so for both language models, I assume, although I haven't tried exactly those experiments with them, but also for the agents, if there's a particular way you want that agent to generalize, you really have to convey it in some other way besides the experience. Other questions? People online also, if you want, if you have any questions. If not, it seems like most of them were during the time. So um, then let's wrap up here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah? Oh, is, can you, is, is it still a time to ask a question? Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, great, perfect. Um, thank you. So my, my question, my question is a general one. Um, you were talking about differences between passive and active learning and that this difference is in a sense, the boundaries, it's a soft boundary in a sense, right? Because defining intervention is explanation and intervention and so on and so on. So we can think about this, uh, these things. Um, and I, I wanted to uh, extend this a little bit. Um, and ask you about your opinion on the limitations of, of interventions and of understanding interventions in case of animals, humans and other animals. So for instance, just two days ago, I was sitting and taking some notes um, in front of a fountain and there was a dog and this fountain was like randomly spitting water in some direction and there was a trick because there was a diode, like a yep. lead diode inside um, the fountain. And so the water was transporting the light, right? So every time the water was hitting the ground, there was a spot of light. And this dog was repeatedly trying to catch this light. Yep. And although, although it was able to intervene in the, in the environment, so it was able to go to the source of, of the water and I don't know, block it or do something like this, uh, it just didn't, it just didn't do it. Yep. And at some point, uh, and at some point, it just got bored. So this is the mechanism that in, in psychology we, all, we often refer to as habituation. Um, so there is something uh, in, in this behavior. I, I saw something, uh, something pretty heuristic. So the learning of this model of, of the world model by this particular dog um, was not really based on on the intervention and just started ignoring something that was not important to him perhaps in the long run right so this is more like an emotional learning or associational le learning uh, than than causal learning yep. so, so my question to you was uh or is um uh, how do you think what what is the what is the limit uh for for for, for the models uh, taking into account that we humans and other animals uh, are also not perfect causal learners, what would it what would it mean that we have a human level causal learning model? Ooh, interesting question. Yeah. So, like, look, the, there's a variety of limitations. So, right, one of the things I mentioned briefly early in the talk is that. In the first experiments with the cause of DAG, we had this version where the, the agent, the expert policy intervenes on every variable. I was like, oh, that's not realistic. So maybe we have some cue that tells you which variables to intervene on. But of course, in the real world, we don't have either of those options, right? We don't really know what all the relevant causal variables are. In fact, I think that thinking of things as discrete causal variables is even a little bit misleading in most cases. And so, you always have to have some sort of heuristic policy for which kinds of experiments you're going to try, and that might not 
allow you to discover the proper causal structure if it sort of omits the kinds of experiments that are important, which is what it sounds like happened for the dot, right? And there might be some more fundamental limitations, of course, too. Like, I think about this a lot because I used to be interested in cosmology and physics, like how the universe forms. And that's a great example of a case where we'd like to have some scientific understanding, but we definitely can't do any causal intervention experiments on that process, right? It happens, it's beyond the scale of anything we can conceive of intervening on. Um, and so you have to just make do with what you can from observational data and sort of like trying to use counterfactual reasoning about, oh, well, if the inflation process was like this, then the things we'd observe now would be like this, but we can't do interventions on those processes. So there's also, you know, many cases where we're fundamentally limited in terms of what we can infer about the causal structure of the world by the interventions that we can actually possibly do as a system. And of course, the agents in more complex settings are limited too. They might not be able to intervene on the underlying structure of a game engine, for example. They can only move around in the world that it renders or something. So I think both of those things, heuristics and the limitations on what a system can intervene on, yield sort of fundamental limitations on how much of causal structure it can actually infer. And so I think that like, in order to define what human level causal inference would mean in a particular domain, you have to kind of like focus on particularly that domain and just empirically see what humans could do. So one example is my colleague Jane Wong uh, has this paper on this RL benchmark called Alchemy, which I encourage all of you to work on if you're interested in causal structure. It's a very cool causal metal learning environment. Um, and, you know, playing that environment as a human, it's pretty hard to figure out what the causal structure is, just, you know, naively. Um, and so I think humans were good at inferring causal structure in situations that have some relation to the things we know quite a lot about. It can be quite hard for us in situations that are totally unlike things we've done before. And so, yeah, I, I think broadly we're just, we're using some heuristics that are based on our prior knowledge, kind of like I think we do for most other things. Maybe we're pretty good causal reasoners, relatively speaking, relative even to language models, but that's another question. I think. Hopefully that answers it. Yeah, thank you. All it's right. A, it's a broad and open topic, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, the time is very quick, but uh, because we're already on time. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I just, so it occurs to me that, uh, well, neural networks are very good at interpolation and not so good at extrapolation. And uh, language models are interpolating on human language very well and seeming to extrapolate. And that's maybe where the, like the cause of them being able to understand causal reasoning is coming in. But do you think that might just really be because human language has loads of examples of people doing causal reasoning, basically. And so really, it, it is just kind of still interpolating, if that makes sense. So, okay, I, I think the distinction between interpolation and extrapolation, as you move to more complex spaces, is quite hard to define clearly. Um, so, for example, if I, you know, in the case of my agents generalizing to new causal structures, is that interpolation or extrapolation. It never saw those causal dependencies being present. So in some sense, they're like outside the convex hull of the causal graph structures that the agent observed in training. But nevertheless, broadly, I would say that it is kind of interpolation. It's seen a lot of other structures that are similar to those, right? And similarly for the language models, I definitely think that it's important for the models to have seen a lot of causal inferences during training like the ones it sees on Wikipedia and on Stack Overflow and so on in order to solve this task. I mean, I think in general, you know, a system needs to have some relevant experience in order to be able to solve a new task with any sort of efficacy, right? In a no free lunch kind of way, that generally has to be true, right? And so, yes, I think it's important that the language models have seen some causal inferences before. I'm not sure if I would say that means they're just interpolating because I'm not really sure what that means in a large structured space of natural language tasks. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe that's a good place to end. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much, Andrew, for coming here today. Um, so as you know now, the people in person, we're gonna have some time with food and you can ask more questions to Andrew uh, now. Um, that is courtesy of our sponsor, Google DeepMind. And uh, we still need to confirm, but we will try to come back in the summer for some more seminars. So thank you very much for coming. I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.